Okay, welcome back, and here we are in Oaklawn, Illinois, where we are in front of the home of Rick Goldschmidt. So I thought, let's go pay him a visit and see what he's doing for the holidays. All right, let's knock on the door and talk to Rick. Hi, Rick. Hey. Thanks for coming, for letting us see your house here, and uh, Rick Goldschmidt. So let's go check on and see what he has to offer. Here we are at the home of Rick Goldschmidt. Rick, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to you. Thanks so much for letting us in here. Um, originally, we're going to talk about a certain subject, but a holiday subject. But uh, walking in here, this is a, a really neat toy house, in my in my opinion. How did you get involved with this toy collection? Um, it just came out of my uh, love for art. I'm an illustrator. My degrees in illustration. And Jack Davis and Paul Coker, who designed all the Rankin Bass holiday specials and films, are two of my favorite artists. So um, once I started collecting their work and Rankin Bass's work, it kind of branched out into the Green Hornet, Batman, uh, monster stuff, and all kinds of pop culture. That is roughly about, do you have a count of how many items are in here? <laughs> no, it's probably a good, oh. now it's probably like 4,000 items, oh. I would say, at least. Is that going to collector shows, uh, eBay? Yeah, um, I used to go to the St. Charles uh, Toy Fair out there, the toy uh, antique toy show, and I bought a lot of stuff there, and I appeared there a few years ago. And, uh, yeah, when eBay was booming <laughs> and uh, a lot of uh, movie conventions and things like that. Okay, Rick, so we're standing right now in your living room uh, here, and let's hear kind of generally what you have. Uh, it's a lot of music-related um, and also pop culture things. My band actually practices uh, in this area here, right. so... Yeah, um, it's kind of tight, but we we enjoy it. I have the Captain Action collection there, um, which a lot of that's pretty rare stuff and, um, you know, different. I have a whole TV Guide collection from the mid-60s, too, and sometimes I have to use them to reference rank and vast things and and see when they aired uh, you know, what time they aired and what kind of ads are in there and so forth. And then you got some classic uh, Muppet uh, from the Sesame Street. Area. Oh, yeah. I actually have the very first licensed Kermit the Frog puppet over there um, that Ideal Toys put out in 1965. And then I have his first puppets, um, uh, Wilkins and Wonkins, oh, yeah. um, that he did for Wilkins Coffee. Um, so I love the early Jim Henson stuff. Oh, yeah stuff that he did before i was even born <laughs> um do you, does that a museum ever approach you to have stuff showcased in or as an exhibit yeah i've been talking to a few museums in chicago too about uh, doing an exhibit so it's been in quite a few areas um, anything else that we touched? I think we touched. On. Oh, the mask. Uh, and is that you got those classic masks as well? Those box masks. Where'd you Where'd you get those? Or yeah, I just I like uh, the old packaging and the box art for Halloween costumes of the '60s, and that's what we wore as kids uh, for many years. So it has a warm spot in my heart. I wish they would still do. Uh, costumes like that instead of gory rubber foam costumes from Walking Dead and things like that. Um, you don't see enough of those colorful characters anymore. Right, right, absolutely. Um, okay, let's move on. Okay, Rick, here's another section of the uh, of your house, and uh, where are we standing in right now? Uh, this is the room that I work in. Uh, with my computer stuff and packing mail and and do artwork and things like that. Uh, do you do it for uh, a business or do you just do it for your own personal? Uh, it's both. <laughs> but yeah, it's not as um, profitable as as we would like. Uh, but but yeah, we do a, a lot of different things for a lot of different people, and it's all about making people happy. 
Yeah, definitely in this room. Now, I saw you see also a lot of D. Martin, Jerry Lewis uh, pictures. Are you fans oh, yeah. of them as well? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I have a, a one sheet from each of their films and tons of lobby cards and all kinds of rare memorabilia of Martin and Lewis. And then I see a, a <laughs> Sean Connery, James Bond, which things I've never seen before existed. Yeah, well, uh, Sean Connery is James Bond to right, me. Yes. There is no other James right. Bond. Um, but yeah, I love James Bond, and um, so yeah, I have a big collection of spy memorabilia too. And uh, again, just glancing around the room, I see uh, oh, the Thunderbirds, the classic Thunderbirds. Oh yeah, was '60s just the era that what well, you could comment on, where maybe a lot of creativity was? Or? Yeah, definitely. Um, Jerry Anderson did all of those uh, marionette, uh, super marionation uh, puppet shows, and those are similar to Rankin Bass in that, you know, he had characters like Troy Tempest and we would see it on WGN as kids and, and, and wonder, you know, how did they do that? And not only were they marionettes, but they also had some kind of computer um, working their mouths and eyes and things when people were you know sinking the dialogue so not many people know that but he developed his own kind of puppet style you rang the lady um and then you had a cabinet of wgn uh, again a lot of wgn back in the 60s 70s really brought up that there was an outlet for them to showcase this yeah, well, my earliest memories as a kid was Garfield, Goose, and Friends, right. and Bozo Circus, and Ray Rayner. And um, I remember Clutch Cargo coming on <laughs> as a kid, and and just all the different segments, and VJ and Dirty Dragon, and, and the cartoons he showed. And it's just, I think that's what formed my love of pop culture, period. Um, well, let's talk about uh, the uh, Rankin and Bass. So how did you get involved with Rankin and Bass? Well, it, it was through Jack Davis and Paul Coker. I was talking to them on the phone and realized that they designed most of the Rankin Bass films. And I asked Jack Davis, you know, whatever happened to them? You yeah. haven't heard anything about them in a long time. And he said, oh... I'm still doing work and give Paul Coker a call. So I did. And Paul Coker gave me Arthur Rankin's phone number in Bermuda. And I called him up there and said, I wanted to do a book. And he said, give me two chapters. So I put together two chapters. And this was at the point when computers were just starting. So I kind of cut and pasted it together and uh, sent it to him and he liked it and he sent me his life story on a little cassette wow. and uh, it, it, the book started from there. I think he envisioned a book that was going to be mostly text and tell his story but, but my book was more of a visual documentation of everything that they did. And maybe for those who don't know that the Rankin and Bass were the ones responsible for the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Frosty the Snowman, it goes on. Yeah, those Santa Claus is coming, Santa Claus is coming to town, those those things. So how did they get started with, Did they for, They probably didn't expect it to be shown today, but where did they come with the idea of doing such classic uh, Christmas stories? Well, they started with Pinocchio because Arthur's favorite Disney film was Pinocchio. So he did a syndicated series based on Pinocchio that was part of all the children's shows of the 60s. So they showed it on Garfield, Goose, and Friends, and they showed it in all these different markets. And it took a long time to make any money from that. Um, they also did Tales of the Wizard of Oz, which was another segmented series. So Arthur's neighbor was Johnny Marks, who wrote the song Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and he would see him at parties, and he said, you know, we should make this into a television special, and they got Return to Oz on the air based on their series, and that was the first thing that they did for NBC. The second thing was Rudolph, and when Rudolph hit it was a major success. It got him a movie deal 
with Joseph E. Levine, three pictures. It got him another special on NBC, The Ballad of Smokey the Bear, and it just opened up a lot of doors. So once they did that, that was kind of the the uh, template uh, for what was to come for the next 20, 30 years. Nothing. Also, what was really neat is that the, that stop motion animation, which they was um, not really used in a lot of stuff, uh, and they really brought it to the forefront, especially on TV. Right. Well, their uh, form of it was called Animagic. Yeah. And that was a perfect name because there is magic in that stop motion. And it was done in Japan. And as I was growing up as a kid watching these shows, I would have no idea that was made in Japan. Mm -hmm. It looks so American, you know, Hermie the dentist and all these characters, Sam the snowman, you wouldn't think they were animated in Japan. But Arthur found studios in japan that were so uh, ahead of their time Um, he knew that this would be big on american television especially if he brought personality to the characters but actually giving them characterization that wasn't seen in that art art form with fred astaire and boris karloff and burl ives i mean it you don't even think of them as puppets. You think of them as these characters you grew up with your entire life, the heat miser and snow miser. And I mean, they're so, they have so much personality, the winter warlock, the burgermeister, meister burger. It's just incredible. Like the amount of personality they brought into the art form. So you said Arthur Reichen kind of looked at the, in Japan, it was, was it his partner, Jules Bass that were, that formed the company or how did that come about? Well, Arthur started the company in the 50s, and it was called Videocraft International, and primarily they worked on commercials. And Jules was at an ad agency, um, and he would often see him at different functions and different things that they were working on, and really was a friend, a good friend that he brought in, and then they changed the name to Rankin Bass in the mid-60s, and he became a co-producer with Arthur. And his function was primarily in New York. Um, He wrote all the lyrics to all the songs. He worked with a lot of the voice actors. And he had different functions that Arthur didn't. Arthur was in Japan a lot. Um, He loved Japan, he loved the culture, and he also loved the animators and worked with them. So they all um, put their talents together and formed this company. So he, he formed this core of people that were really, really talented. Put one foot in front of the other And soon you'll be walking across the floor Put one foot in front of the other And soon you'll be walking out the door it's, yeah, and the biggest one is also those songwriters, you know, because those tunes just resonate today. Well, the Johnny Mark songs in Rudolph are phenomenal, yeah. and he had a, a long time to come up with those songs. Um, Rudolph was written prior, and Holly Jolly Christmas was a big hit when the this, when this show came out. But after that, it was Maury Laws and Jules Bass that wrote put one foot in front of the other and the heat miser and snow miser songs and the songs in here comes peter cottontail which are tremendous so that songwriting team was perfect for what rankin bass was doing in the puzzle of life there is one piece that keeps it from breaking you can tell when it's there from the sound that your own heartbeat is making. And one thing that I think of the Christmas time is that I actually saw for the first time Mad Monster Party on Christmas Eve, which was really a Halloween type of movie. But uh, to this day, I mean, as a full feature, like you said, those characters come to life. Oh, yeah. Mad Monster Party, it was the 50th anniversary this year. Oh. 
and Shag, the artist, friend of mine, did a nice print, and, and we did a book signing out in uh, West Hollywood and Palm Springs. So there's a huge following for Mad Monster Party. Get really inspired tim burton to do nightmare before christmas and it inspired a lot of people to get into the animation and art world and uh they never seem to at least now recently sort of done the merchandising end or maybe even a theme park were they not interested or were they ever approached to something like that well general electric owned all of the shows um and they formed an entertainment division called tomorrow entertainment so that, that was financed by General Electric, so they owned it. So they really, they got a portion of the sales of the show, but they don't get like residuals from it every time it's aired now. Mm-hmm. And they wouldn't have benefited in, in the merchandising so much. Um, so it, it's interesting that a big company like GE owned all the shows. Yeah. Um, like today, you know, all these mergers and all these big companies are taking over. Even the rank and vast specials have been bought and sold many, many times. Did GE then make strike the deal with CBS to play it every year, or how did that come about? That CBS. Uh, yeah, that's how it uh, went about, and then eventually, Lorne Michaels bought the catalog. Um, you know, the producer of Saturday Night Live, and then he sold it to Golden Books and. Then it got sold and sold and sold. Um, but yeah, GE was part of the process of getting the shows on the air and uh, them staying on the air. Actually, Rudolph started on NBC and then switched over to CBS in the early 70s, early to mid-70s, and um, and it stayed there ever since. And it's always the ratings winner for the week. So you would think they'd want to do a nice documentary and extend that, that those ratings, but uh, so far, uh, no, no deal. (laughs) Um, Well, let's talk about your book because there's more information about the story of ranking the best that that created these holiday classics. Um, Let's hear about the book. Well, the 20th anniversary edition of the Enchanted World of Rankin Bass uh, came out and uh, the 20th anniversary was November 20th of this year. And now it's 412 pages. It started out at 176, so it's a big book loaded with col- color. Um, did you get to talk to either Arthur Reichen and Jules Bassett? Oh, yeah. I talked to both of them, and Arthur and I formed a really strong friendship. So we uh, we kept that relationship up for a long, long time until he passed away and. Uh, 2014, uh, the 50. He didn't quite get to see the 50th anniversary of Rudolph, but he knew about the postage stamps because I helped with those. So he was pretty honored by um, his characters being featured on U.S. postage stamps. Uh, do you have a website or a Facebook oh, yeah. that people can look or uh, check out your uh, books? Yeah, miserbros.com. It's M-I-S-E-R-B-R-O-S.com. And I also keep a blog at enchantedworldofrankinbass.blogspot.com, which I post things on daily, and I'm on Instagram and Facebook and all of those, uh, all of those social media places. Well, thank you for sharing the stories of uh, Rankin and Bass and uh, letting us in your house with all this great uh, memorabilia here, and it's a great a toy house. And uh, we thank you so much, uh, Rick, for uh, letting us in, and thanks so much. And I always want to say it, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs>